Welcome to Decades of Horror, the classic era. Signs of a pin. Hmm. Forbid access around the crater? Understood. In effect until further notice? I'll send out a bulletin right away. This is episode 101, recorded June 8th, 2021. I am your host, Jeff Moore, and on this podcast, we cover the good, the bad, and maybe even the ugly horror films released since the beginning of time through 1969. In each episode, we'll discuss the monster spirits, psychos, and villains that have haunted movie-going audiences since the dawn of film history. We're also part of the Gruesome Magazine family of video podcasts, which includes Horror News Radio, the Gruesome Magazine podcast, Heroes and Droids, and Decades of Horror, the classic era of the 1970s and the 1980s. Please subscribe to our Gruesome Magazine YouTube channel. You can also listen to audio-only versions on each podcast from most podcast apps by subscribing to Gruesome Magazine and Horror News Radio. Uh, I should also mention Decades of Horror, the Classic Era is partnering with the Classic Sci-Fi Movie Channel. Uh, the channel launch is already up and going, and we have a half a dozen episodes up on there. So that's what our partnering is. They are running uh, Decades of Horror, the Classic Era on the Classic Sci-Fi Movie Channel. So check that out. It's available on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Android TV, there's an online website and other OTT platforms. So do it. With me this week are my incredible co ghosts. First up is Whitney Cayazzo, an accomplished artist, makeup artist, and writer. How you doing, Whitney? I'm good. Thanks. How are you? I'm excellent. I'm excellent. Awesome. You look mysterious today i'm cold <laughs> it's a freezer oh. in here. <laughs> okay never mind you look cold <laughs> ah and what a bummer chad hunt is not with us today he is uh mm-hmm. under evacuation orders so <laughs> he will not be able to join us um but he shall be back uh next up we have daphne who is awesome stupendous and likable as hell see she's I... smiling i'm telling you how you doing <laughs> I'm doing real good. Real good. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Also with us is Joseph Perry, contributing writer to Gruesome Magazine and to The Scariest Things, When It Was Cool, Horror Fuel, and Ghastly Grinning Websites. Also, fan of the movies, Video Scope Magazine, The Drive-In Asylum Zine, and Diabolique Magazine, and co-host of the Uphill Both Ways podcast. How are you, Joseph? I'm doing pretty well. Whitney, please feel free to send some of the cooler temperatures my way. Because <laughs> I wish I could. It's getting hot and humid here. Aww. It's it's that way here, too, but it's freezing. It's opposite in here. Outside, it's opposite. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, it's 95 here today, yeah. about an hour before we started. Wow. Here. All right. I won't complain uh, as much then. Gosh. We're still hovering yeah, around 89, so... <laughs> And there's our long lost decades for weather report. Um, yeah. On this <laughs> podcast, we'll start by giving some basic details of the film we are covering, followed by each of our first impressions. And then we'll just kind of have a general discussion on whatever trips our trigger. Uh, and in some way, through six degrees of Kevin Bacon, it will relate to the film. <laughs> um, our topic today. And, you know, I am not the kaiju master here. So everybody correct my pronunciation. Rodan, is that correct? Rodan. Ro- Rodan, right. <laughs> Rodan. From 1956. Rodan. Rodan. Correct? Whitney was correct. Rodan. Yay. Rodan. <laughs> um, you want me to take the names, Jeff? Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, the director is the legendary Ishiro Honda. The writers are Takeshi Kimura, Kin Kuronuma, Takeo Murata, and David Duncan for the English <laughs> version. 
Our cast includes one of the, one of those Kinji. things doesn't belong, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, our cast includes Kinji Sahara, Yumi Shirakawa, and uh, Akehiko Hirata. Production company was Toho Films, Ega Company Limited. Filming locations were Fukuoka City, in, which is Fukuoka, Japan, Mount Aso, Kumamoto, Japan. Sasebo, Nagasaki, Japan. And I'll turn it back over to you, Jeff. <laughs> oh, okay. The, uh, so the release date in Japan was December 26, 1956. So a, that's a holiday period in Japan, correct? That is uh, uh, part of the big Christmas, to, well, winter to New Year's holiday. Okay. And in the USA, it was August 6, 1957, my birthday. So, oh, you know, oh. Happy you know. birthday. Um, domestic box office, and well, I'll flesh this out a little more because it says five hundred thousand in U.S. dollars. So, um, road, road, Rodon, Rodon, yes, Rodon grossed an estimated four hundred fifty to five hundred thousand during its opening weekend at seventy nine theaters in New York City metropolitan area. Uh, but also several theatrical circuits, including RKO, announced that the film broke box office records for a science fiction film. So I guess I would have to say that 500,000 is not indicative of the success. I don't Does that make so. sense to you, Sir Joseph? Uh, it makes kaiju scented sense to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And a short synopsis, a large mining accident sets loose prehistoric insects and giant pterosaurs on Japan. So they, they call them giant pterosaurs, but I kept hearing pteranodons all the time in the, in the film, or hmm. at least in the subtitles. What, in the, you guys watched the dub version, was it? R Rodon, Rodon, right? Isn't that what it was said in the but, uh, Comparing them or calling them, I think it was pteranodons also oh. in the dub. Yeah, and that that and that rodon comes from the Japanese word for pteranodon. Mm. All right. So Rado. posters, you know, this is like the chief main uh, U.S. poster. I it's love it. Dive bombing yeah. the military folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The King Brothers. Thundering out of unknown skies, a supersonic hell creature. Okay. Uh, you know, I like the okay. color. I was just going to say, yeah. I love the greens and the reds. It's <laughs> awesome. They could have made but the I'm, face a little more um, realistic. But... <laughs> yeah, the face. He seems kind of happy to be attacking those. So, you know. <laughs> um, it's a happy <laughs> And here's a Japanese poster. Yeah, I believe. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. I kind of dig those. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I love the and screaming I, woman in the middle there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Kind of the center <laughs> point with the uh, the giant yeah. dragonfly larvae. Yes. Um, the screaming woman who I don't remember from the film, but no, the, I missed the red dress. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you get um, lots then, uh, there's no secrets yeah. there. Mm -mm. I, th I think this is, yeah. Found this one as well. See, I like Much this darker. because it's compared with the previous one, which gave away the monsters, this one teases it. Yeah. And it shows mm -hmm. you there's tons of action, mm -hmm. but this one, you know, showed the monsters, gave away. You should pay. Mm -hmm. You have to. You should have to pay to see the monsters. <laughs> and you actually okay. see the characters that we actually see, like mm -hmm. Kikyo right. and mm -hmm. uh, I can't say his name right, but mm -hmm. you. Know, I think we'll get into. Well, if you guys can help me out with names, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but no, it so, actually shows the characters that we actually saw. Mm -hmm. So yeah. The uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. Um, this is also known as uh, Rodon the Flying Monster. Uh, and you want to do the uh, Spanish one? It was it Los Hijos del Volcán, which is the sons of the volcano, or like Los, Los Hijos is also children. 
but it's more like okay. the, the sons of the volcano. Hmm. Okay. That's a good title. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then there was the German one, the Fliegenden Monster von Osaka. <laughs> the Flying Monsters of Osaka. But I don't remember Osaka being... I don't either. Uh, and let's not work. forget the original Japanese title, Soro no da Kaiju Radon. Ooh. I like it. I, po mm -hmm. I apologize to all our Japanese speakers for my poor pronunciation, but I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and that's uh, that's a good point because it's the Japanese was R A D O N in our right. spelling, and you know, in our infinite wisdom, we changed it to. <laughs> well, weren't they worried about it being confused with radon? I, I saw that, oh, but, I, yes, did, but right. I didn't you're know right. if that was a oh, legit. Wow. Right. Yeah, because. You know, moviegoers are just right. Stupid. Not that it's a good reason. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> okay, we have a we have a few uh, taglines, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give these to Joseph, unless somebody else, you know, if somebody feels like they want to do some, that's fine too. Take it away, Joseph. Okay. <laughs> I dedicate this moment to Chad. Yes. All right. Or Tad. <laughs> <laughs> Most horrifying hell creature that ever menaced all mankind. Rodan. Well, there were the not... ones that didn't menace all mankind. Were <laughs> anyway. That's true. But they did say that, uh, well, jumping to a uh, discussion of the film for a moment, there was a line about how uh, the two Rodan creatures could take over the world. <laughs> if they weren't stopped in Japan. So, all yeah. right. Well, Rodan is not to be confused with any other current film. Well, we'll have to check that year's <laughs> releases. No motion picture since King Kong should be compared with this remarkable color spectacle. I disagree. They forgot about Godzilla. <laughs> okay. Now, as a kid, this would have hooked me. More startling than Jules Verne. Because for many years, Mysterious Island, with its uh, Ray Harryhausen giant monsters, was one of my favorite movies. And that was a Jules Verne free adaptation. But uh, when did that come out? I don't know, Jeff. But, but and also, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea came out in like early 50s. I know that. So, right. I, I it seems like an odd wrong. choice to me, more startling than Jules Verne. Like, <laughs> right, right. There's but he a, must have been hot at the time, cinematically. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. So maybe, yeah, maybe one of the adaptations, like the Vincent Price one, Master of the World, maybe one of those were same year. See the power of Rodan. See the might of Rodan. See the destruction of Rodan. Well, they just give away the ending. You don't put spoilers <laughs> in your taglines. <laughs> We know how it's going to end, don't we? Yeah. I loved it's it up like, to that. <laughs> yeah. It's like watching a movie about a war that already happened. You already See, the, the sonic, here, the sonic booms of Rhoda. <laughs> yeah, right. But we don't, unfortunately. <laughs> we hear, hear about the sonic booms of yeah. Rodan. The most shocking name in two million years. All right. That's not much of a sell, but. Cast well, a thousand. Was, uh, hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I think that was too. Isn't that how long they said uh, Rodan had been sleeping undisturbed? Uh, so they're not really comparing the Rodan names to other names. They're saying uh, dude, because it know. hadn't been. <laughs> well, it can't have not been spoken in two million years either because. Correct me if I'm wrong, but people were not speaking two million years ago. Anyway. Excellent Science. tagline. That <laughs> yeah. That's what they that's what they want you to believe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cast of thousands. I don't know. I I mean I remember, you know, the screaming people scenes, but I don't remember thousands, but I'll trust them. <laughs> Never a horror like it. Again, I go back to the recent Godzilla films. Thundering out of unknown skies, 
the supersonic hell creature no weapon could destroy. Well, okay. There's truth in advertising right there. <laughs> when will the military learn that you cannot defeat kaiju with conventional <laughs> weapons? Well, I'm just going to say I was, I was so pounded by the shelling that they did that yes. they replayed it and counted them. And there were oh. 50 explosions on the mountain. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> wow. Just in succession in slow motion. It was awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. And that's something I noticed is up to that point, I mean, I'm I'm not an expert on kaiju either. I'm just going by memory of having fun and watching the movies. Uh, the shelling and, you know, the army attacks on the monsters was the longest one, at least up to that point. So I was thinking... They're, they must have received a higher budget for this thanks to the success of uh, earlier Toho monster movie films. Uh, or they just decided, let's use more of our usual budget for this attack because it went on a long time. Yeah. And no complaints here. <laughs> but, uh, but well, there was uh, lots of, uh, yeah. The, the script... was not too exciting. There wasn't a lot of depth to the script. It was, you know, these guys died. There's earthquakes. There's explosions. Uh, you know, there's blood. There's the monster. You know, stuff. It just wasn't. Um, although, there was a little short monologue about the dangers of uh, hydrogen bomb tests. <laughs> Uh, uh, Whitney and I got Whitney and I got the hydrogen bomb tests in the dubbed version. <laughs> yes. that, that, you did they too. start to okay. film with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean with the American Oh, oh military. they started to film that way, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's well, not well, I didn't in, see that in, in the Right. That's not in the yeah. original Japanese version. In the longer subtitled one, he says, um, I can't say with certainty what caused it. I can only think of one possibility, hydrogen bomb mm -hmm. tests. Mm -hmm. They not only contaminate the air and water, but also exert a powerful influence on the Earth's crust. These new sources of tremendous energy may have awoken Rodan from his 200 million year slumber. Well, there you go. It should have been 200 million. Years, <laughs> okay. not two million. Uh, and may have. They're not anyway. committed to saying it, it actually caused it but right at the beginning of the american film or american version i'm sorry uh they show two different tests bomb tests oh so uh they drive that home a little harder mm -hmm. yeah now i definitely have to go back and watch the dubbed one i'm sure the dubbed one is what i saw as a kid yeah but, um yeah, you know it's a it, i can't remember but it, they didn't yeah like jeff said this there's one sentence where where the press is asking them kind of why did you where did he come from and that was the only mention mm -hmm. all right so let's get into first impressions and this is uh young master perry's pick so we'll, we'll let him go first let's what did you first see this with an unwrapping session here Yay. oh wow oh, oh, no. Yay. I, I got this cutie on saturday nice <laughs> I think my oh, girlfriend got it for me. Actually. Oh, oh that's cool. so cool. Wow. And now I have the other one I showed last week, which is somewhere over here. I can't uh -huh. dig all around. Now. <laughs> but now I have two Rodan. I have the Yay. set. Yay. You have the, the set. set. <laughs> so you need, to, you need to run a wire in the background behind you. Have yeah. them. <laughs> that would be awesome. Right. Yeah. All right. Or just have a lava pit in my hand and let it. <laughs> Paul. Uh, okay, so all right. Well, I first saw, uh, as Daphne mentioned, Rodan as a kid, uh, and it would have been on TV. And uh, the reason I chose it is because I think it's uh, one of the probably my third favorite of the serious uh, kaiju films. Of course, the original. Gojira or Godzilla, uh, War of the Gargantuas would be number two, and then Rodan, Rodan is number three, and I like its serious approach. And Jeff, you're right; the script 
isn't super deep, but uh, it's treat the subject is treated rather seriously, you know, especially compared later with Tohu's kitty movie mm -hmm. phases of their kaiju films. But this was before that, yeah. and I think the origin story is really good. Uh, and I like that they uh, tease us with the dragonfly larvae mm -hmm. at the beginning. Uh, and those you know, are called everybody, what? How do you, Megan, Megan Nalan or something? Or Megan uh, hang on just a minute. I have a note here and I can help with that. Uh, yeah, Megan, Megan Neuron, right. Uh, I'm not sure if that's, you know, the English name of those guys and if there was a different Japanese name or not. But anyway, um, let's see. So I like that they, they teased that, but anybody who had seen the poster or anything, uh, or, you know, as Jeff and Chad and I have mentioned, seeing pictures in books or magazines before you see the movie, everybody knew that wasn't the real monster. But if you're going in cold, you know, oh, okay. Uh, those are kind of impressive, but then later we get the birth. We get the uh, UFO sightings of what would be one of the Rodon, and then we get the birth and instant growth of the second one from egg to adult. And they, we saw it. It looked kind of like a baby, right, everybody? Mm -hmm. But then the next day it was an adult, and they kind of alluded to the film. Maybe well, even then when they, the ground. when they showed the size of the larvae, compared to humans mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. they showed the size of the larvae compared to the baby that came out of the egg yeah it was it was pretty pretty uh, catastrophic already <laughs> and i love that scene where it starts to eat the mega neurons as soon as it's hatched anyway we'll get to details later so uh right so i saw the dubbed wrote on you know several times growing up and then a few years ago, started to see the original Japanese version subtitled in English. And there, were, there are differences, as we mentioned, and probably will a bit more. Uh, and it's even kind of more serious in the presentation in the Japanese version. And I loved it even more. Uh, so we hadn't done a kaiju film in a while. And I just thought... Let's do one of my favorites. So that's why I chose Rodan. And I uh, hope everybody else liked it too. We're going to find out today. And let's see. Uh, yeah, I'll save other thoughts for later. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, well, let's go with uh, Daphne next. Um, have you seen I, this before? I have seen it before. I have. This was the first time mm -hmm. I've seen the... Um, the uh, subtitled version. Um, I'd seen it when I was a kid. Uh, a lot of the kaijus, but not, probably not, I'm sure probably not all of them. I didn't get super into it, but I loved watching them when they were on TV, usually on Saturdays or um, sometimes in the summertime, they'd have like a the week of kaiju or something like that. They'd have it when you're out of school and you could watch, watch it. Nice. Um, um, so that's probably when I first saw it. And I, I did, I've watched it a few times since then. Um, just because if it's on TV, I, I'd, I'd like to watch it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I've, I'm definitely not an expert in the kaiju, but it, even watching it yesterday, I'm like, oh God, this is so much fun. <laughs> and really thinking like, oh, I wish I had a little bit more time to watch both versions because, you know, you it's different experiences both times. So I'm really excited to hear um, about the dubbed one too. My brother and I both um, loved watching stuff like this. And in the, we kind of talked about this a little before um, we started recording um, some anime and stuff, but my brother and I loved watching before school. There was um, an anime called uh, our star blazers, which we watched pretty much from beginning to end and they started all over again. And then, so when we got to watch some monster movies in the summer or, or on Saturdays, it was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Uh, Whitney, how about you? When did you this, first see this? Did your brothers, have you watched this? <laughs> so honestly, I haven't seen this one. And yes, my brother is oh. more of a 
fan of the kaiju world and all of that but i i even asked him i said do you know of this one and he said no i i haven't given this one a chance i don't know much of it but i've heard of it and like well how, how can you not know but i guess that happens i don't know mm-hmm. but no i mean i watched this and i watched it dubbed um and wow i I don't know what to say right now. There's stuff that we can discuss <laughs> during. It's just, gosh, just, just, it's so typical if you're really into these kinds of things, big monsters and um, a lot of manic uh, and panic kind of things going on with characters, just trying to keep some of these these creatures at bay and there's there's just military action kind of going on i mean i mean this is the kind of stuff that you really enjoy when you're like with well like daphne was saying with her brother i this is the kind of stuff i would see with my brother i just haven't seen this one until recently so yeah good stuff huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I must have lived in the only place uh, in the U.S. <laughs> that didn't have kaiju movies when I was a kid. Oh, now, no. it could be that I was a kid uh, in different different decades, but I had friends that were into that stuff that went to them at the theater, but it was nothing. I don't know why I didn't, but I didn't. Uh, I don't even remember them. I kind of remember Godzilla being a thing, but I don't remember all the other stuff. So, um, anyway... Um, yeah, I enjoyed this, but from a point of view of, you know, the, the seriousness of it and the military. And uh, it was interesting to me what they tried to do with the flying creature versus Godzilla, right? This was, um, well, I guess as half human, you don't really count that as kaiju, do you? Uh, he's not giant, but... It's uh, let's call it kaiju adjacent for now. Okay, okay. So you've got Godzilla, Godzilla uh, raids again, and uh-huh. Rodan. Um, so I'm trying to think of what to what to bring up. I I just thought it was cooler than hell that the first time we see uh, Rodan flying, he's leaving a jet trail or a vapor trail. Yeah, <laughs> it's supersonic speed. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to figure that out. You know, I guess it was shockwaves or something, and yeah, it also seemed something. odd that the, uh, the the sound effect seemed to me to be like jet engine sounds, which are not the same as the sounds of you know flying wind. You know? Right. Uh, so I. I I mean, it's interesting. It gave you the impression of speed, right? Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think even uh, in some and of I the lo- dialogue, it, they mentioned it too, because one of the guys was, when the one of the guys that was uh, chasing after it in um, a small the jet, and then he was taken down, they even said, oh, well, it, it seemed like something had taken it down at supersonic speed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that 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 stuff was it was fun, you know. And there was there was some quick cuts too, you know. It, it's interesting how what they thought was important and what was left and what wasn't. So, like when the three guys that go into the mine all get killed by the uh, the uh, mega mega Mulan, um, they they all end up in a in a in a bloody heap. And the next time you see them, the next the next cut is you see these bloody stretchers wheeled into this room that's got this tank that's apparently there specifically for washing dead bodies, I guess, which is kind of cool, I guess. Maybe it was a coroner's office. But there was no, like, how do we, you know, we discovered that they're all dead and we had to go rescue them out of this dangerous area. It was just, boom, they're there. You know, they died Mm -hmm. through there. I I just, nothing wrong with it. I just found it, found it interesting that there was no connecting scene there. Um, But anyway, I, 
I enjoyed it. And talk about military gone wild at the end. <laughs> yes. Throwing everything wow. uh, they can in the kitchen sink at this thing. Yet um, for decades after that. <laughs> yes. They still try uh, to defeat Kaiju with the military. I just love how extended it, it just went on. <laughs> it was all I know. I know. <laughs> That's what I said. It was so long. I had. To, I just had to count them, uh, and, I, and it was hard to keep up with. It. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some of them were rockets. Some of them were from the uh, that multi-tube uh, rocket launcher. Some of them were tanks. <laughs> right. You know, that was that was decent. Um, so let's I, let's talk about if we can snake out what the differences are, like you mentioned this, the, mm -hmm. the atomic explosions, Joseph, I don't know if you know the other version at all, Whitney. Um, I don't. Cause I, I don't know the dubbed one enough to say anything. So I guess it's going to be on you, Joseph, to uh -oh. <laughs> see what you can come up with for differences. Oh, uh, okay. Well, Gosh, I haven't seen the subtitled in a couple of years, but uh, if I hear differences between what we're the four of us oh, talking okay. about, I'll, I'll jump in. Well, the okay. subtitled one, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff. I think it just starts with um, them getting ready to go down in the mine and kind of talking about uh, fighting. The, there was a couple of guys were fighting. Two guys the, had the a fight. The two guys yeah. were fighting, and they were just going down into the tunnel, and that's where that's where it started. Um, okay. The reference to the hydrogen bomb was like probably maybe Halfway at least half, if not two yeah. thirds of the way through. Yeah. 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 And so for the beginning of the dubbed one, uh, we got some narration and mm -hmm. actual footage of bomb testing. And, uh, you know, what are the consequences of that to nature? Mm -hmm. And uh, then I believe it's Key Luke came on as uh, the narrator and uh, as the main character, main male character. And uh, let's see, it, then they jump to the fight. But from what I understand, the fight scene was cut much shorter for the American version. And then they just went directly and they showed the tension between the two men. And then they went into the mines. Mm -hmm. that's, I, uh, that's really interesting I uh, um, <laughs> did anybody else how do I want to say this my my <laughs> safety antenna were wiggling when I saw that that uh, cart whatever it was they were riding in because <laughs> there was like there was no room for their legs there <laughs> That was the smallest little thing you could possibly sardine yeah. uh, people into. And, I, and you know, I, I try to understand you don't have a whole lot of extra room in the mine, right? But yikes. <laughs> I was just going to say, and you kind of mentioned this when you were talking about your reactions to seeing it the first time, but um, I kind of liked how... It, it everybody seemed to be connected somehow. The, I don't know if it was because it was like a, a village that was around this mine, but everybody knew each other. The volcano, the geologists, the the um, everybody, the medical people, the um, the news art, the news folks, um, I, and I got a real kick out of that. Kind of like everybody being in everybody's you know kind of business, discussing things, um, making decisions, and um, so there was a lot of enjoying kind of this kind of uh, you got to, ex you got to uh, accept the um, unreality of it, that this is how that people would know, Oh yeah, well they're doing seismic testing over here. And, but we're doing, we're <laughs> digging stuff over here in the mine, you know yeah. um, I really, I got a kick out of that. I really, I really enjoy, enjoyed that. That was fun. So did you guys, uh, uh, recognize the lead actors from, for instance, Godzilla. Hint, from hint. what, Jeff? <laughs> uh, from Godzilla. I mean, in this movie, the professor, Akahiko Hirata, right. which I'm sure I butchered, 
was no, no. also the scientist in Godzilla the that came tragic, up with the oxygen right. destroyer. Right. It had a patch on, right? Mm -hmm. Same actor. And Kenji Sahara is in a bunch of Toho movies. I think that's pretty common for them. Um, yeah. Yeah. The boy Sh Shigeru, the uh, engineer who goes catatonic for a while. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm bad with names, but there was a minister too, I should say. I don't know. Can't say the names right. Don't know if I want to try. <laughs> uh, a minister? For, like, was it for Kenji? Like, or my minister? He was, okay. well, oh, minister I don't know what they called him in the dub version. Oh. Okay, he was he was an engineer in the 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 one we saw, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he might have been mm -hmm. given a different name, like Whitney's alluding to. Yeah, in the, but I don't remember. I don't exactly remember his title. Mm -hmm. So, I was too busy being bombarded with the explosions. I lost all my <laughs> really? character. So well, as usual. <laughs> We see the strains of uh, music by Akira mm -hmm. the Fukubi, um, which harken back to Godzilla, even though maybe slightly different. Mm -hmm. They're reminiscent. Did everybody like the music? I mean, it's pretty classic, I think, for this time. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it had, I mean, it just has its style where you just know, like, this is that world, that universe of these films. Mm -hmm. So, in the, I, I, so I, I just thought of a possible difference. Because one of the things I noticed about this movie is how much uh, flying around and how much, you know, uh, military attacking there is so mm -hmm. there, there's a part where you first where they first discover the flying creature and a squadron of jets take off after it and they just fly around for a while nothing's there it, yeah. I, it feels like they're kind of stretching out the scene they're trying to follow it and it's too fast and blah 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 and then all of a sudden it turns around and crashes right into mm -hmm. or they lose it maybe that was the first one that they crash into um, I really dug that first sky shot they had of the the vapor trail of Rodan like going all curly Q around. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I love that too. Violent. That's fun uh, and to like you know totally unexpected because uh, as you mentioned, Jeff, what does the source? What is the source of that vapor trail? But. Um, yeah. But I guess it's meant to show how uh, unpredictable its flight pattern can be, right? <laughs> and how difficult it would be for the it's turning the around fighters. To, yeah, <laughs> a creature that size. <laughs> it's writing its name in the it air. Speeds at supersonic <laughs> speed. Yeah. Make right. turns at supersonic speed. Well, um, I love how they used it to kind of hint at it before you really even saw how how huge he was or or anything. It was like, whoa, what would who would how what you know you didn't i love that they use that that way it you know it kind of looked like the uh the shape of a of a uh b2 bomber <laughs> you know 50 years early mm -hmm. uh <laughs> this this the stealth bomber um oh i didn't even think about that you're right <laughs> when we get to when we get to bioengineering right biomimicry <laughs> um all right well, let's take a look at this. So this was, uh, what, what about the color? I mean, this was the first color one, right? I was really sucked into the color. Um, a lot of it, I think, was because of just the, the kind of countryside. Uh, so there's lots of greens and really cool countryside. But just something about, something about the color was really, really nice. I don't know if it was in the uniforms that they chose or even like the color of the cars. But um, I really enjoyed... I really enjoyed that. I don't know. I'm I'm sorry I can't explain it better than that, but I was definitely sucked in and noticed when I was watching it how how beautiful it was. Maybe someone else could do a better job explaining, but I I really liked it. I I think I know exactly what you mean because yes, you see a lot of the natural habitats of things, especially 
like the earthy substance mm-hmm. of the the mining kind of thing uh, from the exterior, especially mm-hmm. when you would see uh, things kind of crumbling in inward into the earth and um, just seeing the small details of the the design of that and making everything so earthy and even like you said, you would see some of the green and I, I really liked that the contrast of that earthiness made it look a little, usually I don't like seeing anything muddy on a character, <laughs> but I, I thought it was, it actually made sense to see the, the creature Rodan itself have that muddy look because I mean, it's coming from that, egg from that place and i just mm-hmm. thought okay i guess it fits it's earthy it's muddy it's got that that tone to it mm-hmm. i'm glad you you mentioned the landscape and the landslides uh mm-hmm. whitney because uh my first point i'll get to in a minute but since you reminded me of that i thought they looked great i mean they mm-hmm. looked devastating i mean yes. unrealistic right <laughs> uh, but devastating yes uh, they were awesome yeah and, <laughs> yeah and uh i think the color uh palette really added to that as well and compared with the natural surroundings i think they did a good job of recreating that but the first thing that i that really hit me about the color was the set design in the cave uh, when, just a minute, I'm forgetting everybody's names, uh, when uh, Shigeru was uh, in the cave by himself and he saw the larvae and he saw the hatching. The cost, the set design on that is amazing. And the yeah, it was. colors really pop on that, even though it's you know supposedly this very dark, place mm-hmm. that shouldn't have a lot of natural lighting. Uh, we had lots of greens and browns and I believe some kind of brown into red type tones. And mm-hmm. so they did, a, I think they did a splendid job with the color. Definitely. And I think even the color that wasn't uh, more natural, like there was a lot of the pastels in the car of the cars, which I can see that for the time. I really enjoyed a lot of the costumes too, just from mm-hmm. that time period. It's always fun. The pants on the guys that come way up to their yeah. you know, their high upper natural waist, and um, but even like the the um, the sister of the first guy, uh, the two guys that were fighting, the kimono she was wearing was yes, it was brilliant. Gorgeous. It was beautiful with all these bright colors, and um, yeah, it was. It was really interesting. I like the contrast between those. Yeah, I I, I liked it too. I, I I don't know what I one of the things I noticed was how green it was. Mm-hmm. Just it was great color, you know. And considering mm-hmm. it was the first one that 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 they did, um, an excellent job. So w- you talked about the dubbing, um, and I forgot mm-hmm. about this. But apparently, all the dialogue voice, voices were provided by George Takai, Key Luke, another man who's Paul Fries, and one woman. <laughs> That's the way it was quoted in uh, uh, George Takai's autobiography. Hmm. So that was okay. his first uh, professional acting job to do the dubbed. Yes, and Wikipedia does not list. This the woman's name either unfortunately hmm. Hmm. uh but you can pick out paul freeze uh if you're a paul freeze fan especially you can pick out that he's doing so many different voices here and yeah. uh, he changes them up but uh you can still tell that's Paul Freeze, you know. <laughs> and uh, my first known exposure to Key Luke was the Kung Fu series. Yep. Right. And so uh, listening to him now, you can hear uh, Snatch the Pebble from My Hand uh, tone of voice Grasshopper. and pick that out. Right. Exactly. And, uh, but to Kai, I didn't notice as much but yeah he, you know he's definitely in there but they're all doing multiple voices so uh 
obviously freeze is the easiest to uh pick out because i've had the most exposure to him over the years as narrator and uh voice talent so uh i wish we could get the proper credit for the female voice though for the woman hmm. voice actor but uh the yeah, dubbing was good uh you know, we've all seen films from different countries with good dubbing and bad dubbing, right? And this one definitely falls into the good dubbing category. And as uh, I was mentioning before we uh, went live, the dubbing is high status. They do some kind of... Uh, Asian people speaking, Japanese people specifically, uh, speaking English as a second language type voices here, but they're uh, high status. They don't do caricatures of that or anything. Uh, but, and, you know, we do have two Asian actors providing some of those voices, but if I'm not mistaken, Freeze once or twice is asked to do that as well. But again, it's all high status. It's not done for comedy effect or anything, which is really great. Right. I especially enjoyed hearing that most when the narration was going on too, because sometimes when you're telling a story or when someone's telling a story, they really put so much impact into an accent or trying to take on a character. But that was... I, I actually liked hearing it the way it was in the, in the tone. <laughs> right. And, you know, th we've all seen, especially older movies, where it's set in London, for example, but everybody, mm -hmm. or Paris, and everybody's speaking with American accents, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They don't even try to fake it. So this one, at least, this dub version at least tried to uh, have some uh, more authenticity to it, I think. Yeah, it definitely grabbed my attention, especially when he's talking about going down into the mine with the guys. And while they were feeling that tension and uh, some something like with everything going on and, and approaching death or something, I just thought, OK, well, I, I like where this is going with with this yeah. kind of voice. <laughs> yeah, Key Luke, yeah, he put a lot of passion into that. Yeah. To the narration and the character. Yeah. Yeah, I got to watch the dub version now, especially after yeah. learning, yeah. remembering who the voices are. Yeah, he narrates as uh, the main character, right, Whitney? Uh, yeah. As, um, so, the, uh, Kawamura, Shigeru Kawamura. Oh, okay. Yeah, Kenji's character, yeah. So, he comes on after the initial uh, footage of the explosions and everything, and... Uh, does a narrating into this is me. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. I, I, am, I am this character. And he comes back on too. Uh, I think to make some transitions, probably they cut a few things here and there. And so they explained it with his narration or just to make it flow easier for American audiences or something. Well, at least they kept having the Japanese actor doing it, right? or that character was supposedly the one doing the voiceover. So, right. Cause right. in the other ones in Godzilla and, uh, oh, yeah. half human, they totally cut the heck out of it and put Raymond Burr's telling the story. And then, uh, yeah, right. Uh, John Carradine is telling the story. Well, that's an interesting point, Jeff. You were talking about differences between the earlier films, uh, speaking only to the American releases now. As you mentioned, we had Raymond Burr for Godzilla. And now that you have mentioned that, I thought about, yeah, this is the first American release of one of Toho's uh, kaiju films where we don't have an American character inserted into the mix. Mm -hmm. And of course, later they would have some written into the story. But as everybody knows with the original Godzilla, they cut Raymond Burr into scenes uh, or in between scenes of Gojira. And, right. Uh, he was a reporter, I think, right? Right, so. right. Uh, for American audience specifically. But this one was kind of, uh, I guess, transitional between we're not okay. going to cut uh, 
an American actor into this one for the, again, I'm speaking to the American versions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it, that later transitioned into uh, let's have an American actor actually written into this film. Right, because then later on in the '60s we get Nick Adams and uh, right, exactly. What, Russ Tamlin isn't is he the one in mm -hmm. uh, War of the Gargantuans or right? Is it the follow up, I forget. But anyway, yeah, yeah. So they're written in that way. Um, I didn't realize, according to this, George Takai was the first Japanese American actor to do voiceovers for Toho movies. Before oh, okay. that, it was always yeah. Chinese American actors. Uh, so James Hong, uh, Key Luke, Sammy Tong were used. And that the Chinese actors had filled a niche in Hollywood portraying Japanese soldiers and civilians mm -hmm. in war movies. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, so the effects, and I, this is probably oversimplified, but I always <laughs> think of the American monsters, you know, 30s, 40s, and 50s, for the most part, were stop motion animation, and that uh, that's what they were sort of expert at, um, at least in terms of Ray Harryhausen, et cetera. And then the Japanese come in and use suit actors and miniatures, and were really really good at it. There's a couple of, you know, at least in the version that we watched, Daft, there was a couple of pretty glaring scenes that were obviously miniatures that the mm -hmm. they didn't have the perspective down or maybe because it was a you know a remastered or restored image or something it was yeah. <laughs> too clear for for what it was supposed uh, to be but for the yeah. most part i'm always impressed with that stuff it, yeah. it's amazing uh mm -hmm. what they do and, and one of the things i and and then they and then they uh you know create the size through perspective and slow motion Mm -hmm. um, and, and I thought I loved the explosions, you know, we're joking about how many explosions they were, but those are awesome explosions. I mean, yeah, yeah, it yeah. was rock and sparks and stuff flying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did they have, did they use puppets too? Uh, cause there was a couple of yeah. times that I was wondering, okay. Yeah. The hmm. first time, uh, Godzilla pops up in Gojira, uh, it's a puppet head. And in this film, I noticed one I think during the egg birth mm -hmm. <laughs> that I think there was a Rodon head puppet. I was wondering puppet. if that was one, a yeah. puppet. Yeah. Oh, it makes sense. I, I, I think. It was good. I yeah. can't say it was. Yeah. And, and no, they I know to right. cut away, you know, they know how long or how short mm -hmm. rather to show it, mm -hmm. but it, it made its impact. It did. Yeah. Oh, I didn't. I wasn't distracted by it. I think they did good. It was more of just like, yeah, oh, that's yeah. that's not a that's not a man in suit, and that's not stop motion. You know, it's like so. I, it was just cool to see them a, a different a different way. Well, and you could see the uh, the neck wrinkle a little mm -hmm. bit as it turns, mm -hmm. which is actually mm -hmm. kind of adds to the realism. I thought, mm -hmm. right, you know, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, you were talking about the the good quality of the film that maybe we saw in, in the um, subtitled one. Yeah, that, I was distracted one time when they they were trying to send down the um, the carts of ore down to kill the. Um, I can't remember what they were called. I always refer to them as the caterpillar guys, <laughs> but um, but I, uh, I, I call them the giant dragonfly larvae. <laughs> <right? laughs> But the guy is like riding on the the carts of ore, and you could see in the background that it was just kind of oh, moving sets. But I loved it. Yeah, it was wonderful. I loved it. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, it was. That see, uh, I really love charming things like that from mm -hmm. older films, from pre CGI right. films. So it's really fun to see those, and uh -huh. we know uh in all the films where we see things like that that they were doing their best to recreate a uh -huh. cinematic reality right and yeah so a lot of fun you know as it was distributed in the u.s um by the distributors corporation of america as a pre-packaged double feature with a british war for film hell in korea wow or a hill in korea hmm. Which seems kind of odd, um, but that they had so much success with Rodan that they started 
you know, with future releases, it was from the company that gave you Rodan, you know. Mm. So to try to play off of that. Hmm. Jeff, did, was there something in the notes, or if not, I saw somewhere how hugely successful this was as a Japanese uh, film release in the States. It's like the lar uh, largest one of its time, something like that. Right, right. That, and that's why the, the uh, you know, the box office for the U.S., I, I, could, I didn't see any numbers for J Japan, but the box office numbers for the U.S. had this 500,000 number, but that came from very specific locale, uh, as best as okay. I could tell, so 79 theaters in the New York area, opening weekend numbers, right? But all the other information, like from the distributor and from the theater change that, you know, the, the theater, the, the uh, th theatrical or the studios that had their own theater change, like RKO and everything said it was like the biggest science fiction movie of the, of the time. So, right. Yeah. And I saw this is on Wikipedia, but it says it's it was the first Japanese film to receive general release on the West Coast that made a strong showing at the box office. Hmm. Oh, okay. And then then they had an advertising blitz after that uh, on TV. Uh, and they had spots from 10 seconds to one minute. And, you know, one minute spots are never inexpensive. So uh, they really pushed it. The King brothers, I, I suppose, were behind that. So I don't know. There's there's uh, um, information here that, that talks about there were five different scales of models made mm. for Rodan flying props, everywhere from one thirtieth to half scale. However, half scale was supposed wow. to have two hundred seventy feet wingspan, right? I, I don't. I didn't see one hundred fifty foot. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it depends on what the scale is to the uh, the buildings. Like I liked, I, I liked when it came down and landed on the top of that building. Yeah. And then sort of leaped over the edge, and as it's going down, it's just dragging parts of the building down mm -hmm. and crushing stuff down at the bottom. I don't That's know. Great <laughs> stuff. And while it was being fired at, all it had to do really was flap its wings and it was destroying mm -hmm. things just standing there. There's a comment here about having uh, emitting a concentrated jet of air from its mouth, but I didn't get that at all. I thought I was it was coming from the wings. Uh, go ahead. That's what I was just going to mention. Uh, so I'm glad you went first. Uh, uh, that was going to be my question. Did anybody else see? It's really subtle. Uh, and it's one of those, am I seeing this? And then you have to replay it again. But uh, there was at least one scene during the giant battle where there was some type of like airflow, or I don't know if it was supposed to be sonic, uh, you know, to represent a sonic attack or something, mm -hmm. but from its mouth. And uh, I need to rewatch it again, but it was kind of like not exactly dark circles or something. But not very dark. Hmm. It was kind of a gray. Hmm. So if if you do rewatch that, uh, you might notice it now that you're thinking about it. So wow, that's where we're on the same wavelength. Yeah. yeah, yeah well, yeah, because I, there was a question. bunch of <laughs> there was a bunch of scenes where I was thinking, um, what's making everybody fly off the road? And I just assumed it was his. The wings, you know, the, the wash, yeah. you know, of his uh -huh. of the of his wings. Yeah. Anyway. No, I didn't. Well, there's another reason to rewatch. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I stayed up later than I should have last night after watching the film because I was going through notes and saw that uh, Ken uh, Kuro Kuro Numa Ken Kuro Numa, uh, who wrote the original story for Rodan, was inspired by the 1948 uh, UFO story about Captain Thomas Mantell, uh, who Kentucky Air National Guard pilot who died in a crash while pursuing what he thought was a UFO, that it oh, wow. was one of three uh, 1948 UFO stories or incidents 
that really led to that becoming a larger thing in the American consciousness. Hmm. So I went down a rabbit hole thanks to. Wow. <laughs> Well, and interesting because uh, Gojira was, you know, based on an actual uh, incident as well. Or, you know, oh, the, the, the lost ship, right? Springboard, right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so the, these springboards uh, that the stories originated from, the films originated from, are really fascinating to me. Anyway, Jeff, I didn't mean to interrupt now. Well, I was going to, this was something I was going to look up too in the, in the area of unbelievably uh, OCD details. <laughs> the, the jets they were flying were uh, F-84 Sabre jets, which were U.S. manufactured. And I was going to look up to see if they had uh, actually, you know, if the U.S. was selling those to them by then. Hmm. But, you know. It's a thing I noticed. Planes, you know. And did you know that there's an internet plane, internet movie plane database? No. But that's you, so you can look cool. up movies. It'll tell you what aircraft are in the movies. I did not know that, but I'm not uh, surprised. Wow. Yeah. But, well, there's one. There's one for uh, for vehicles too, which I look up sometimes. Uh, internet movie. I think it's internet movie car database actually, oh, wow. or something like that, or automotive database. See, in another uh, oh, life, weapons. there's one for weapons too. There's of one course. for weapons too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised by the weapons one, but I I'm glad that there's one for the airplanes and the cars. Because in another life, I am a librarian, and I love when people care so much about that stuff that they have to document yeah. it and make it accessible to other people. <laughs> it's so cool. My uh, my old college roommate, who I'm still in touch with. Uh, his dad was in World War II and was in a tank squadron. And so Russ always really got into World War II details and mm -hmm. memorabilia and stuff. So he's always he was always like telling me, well, they didn't have those guns then, or that's not the <laughs> rifle they would have used, or you know, or that's not the tank it's supposed to be. That's made up to look like. <laughs> that's funny. And when you were talking about the planes, it reminded me how much I loved that scene when um there's a couple of times when the planes crash, but that one where it was just like lots of gore all of a sudden, and then you see his helmet and it's like got blood. Mm -hmm. It's like all bloody in the front. Yeah. It was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I so. want to mention quickly uh, about the Mega Nulon suits because Daphne had mentioned earlier about uh, like the peek behind the curtain when we could see, okay, mm -hmm. this is a puppet or a man in a suit. Mm. So uh, I just saw that they were 15 feet long and uh, operated by three actors, three people. Mm. And in one of the scenes, you could see that the insect was doing a human walk with its front feet, <laughs> uh, you know, compared with a real right. insect walk. Right. right. <laughs> um, but again, that's, Part of the charm of the charm suits. yeah and it i feel cool like when suit. you go back i feel like it when was. you go back and look at it stuff that you've seen before you kind of you kind of start noticing those things more because you're you know kind of and, and yeah if you look at it as a as a part of an appreciation it's always a lot of fun but yeah it was a super yeah. cool suit the noise yes. that they made for that was really creepy too i mean it was silly but i liked that it was so you know yeah. it was almost like a I don't even, I don't know. Cicada. That's yeah, cicada. Yeah. Cicada, yeah. When we did uh, Godzilla versus Mecha Godzilla in the 70s, I think there was there was one creature in there that was, I think he's a, is it a, like a turtle like thing? Or a, I don't know. But it was obviously a guy on his hands and knees. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, here we go. I do believe. <laughs> My other gift for my girlfriend this week, Saturday. I believe you're talking about this guy, Jeff. Ooh. That's cool. Yes. Wow. I think, I think maybe it was. Yeah. That's obviously a hands and knees. I mean, look at that. Right. They don't even try to. Right, right. <laughs> Which What's that one called? Um, Angiris, I'm pretty sure. And Kaiju experts, sorry if I got that wrong. 
That's cool. Look at that. So we did have the uh, that was my micro master uh, suit actor in this. Aruro Nakajima was the uh, Rodan, and apparently the suit was designed specifically for him. So in the in the in the scenes, there are some scenes where it's obvious it's a suit. Not not usually the flying scenes, but when he'd land, you could just see the man standing right within it, right? You know, but it, it was cool. It was oh, yeah. still cool. I think it um, said it weighs 150 pounds. That's pretty intense. Yeah. <laughs> if you read about those uh, suits and the suit actors and what they went through and the accidents they had and like near it. death experiences mm -hmm. uh and how much weight they would lose wearing from sweating right, right. Yeah. So it's, you get a whole new respect for uh you know what yeah. a lot of people make fun of so uh -huh. well heavy suits yeah, and costumes makeup mm -hmm. character acting anything like that there's a lot like even for us that would see some of this stuff behind the scenes. No, I haven't seen that, like, as far as, like, those kinds of suits. But seeing um, people in makeup and knowing the stuff that they have to do with just wearing all this extra stuff, there's there's some pain to the passion. <laughs> yeah. Well, and to support your uh, idea of dangerous things, that when he was flying over the bridge, the cable snapped. Oh. So uh, uh, causing the uh, Aruro Nagajima to fall 25 feet into the water. And uh, it was left in the movie as the scene where he wrote on dives into the water. Uh, and then they turned around and rehooked the thing to had him pull out of the water. But then he said they almost broke again because the suit was so waterlogged. Oh, wow. Gosh. Now, that's got to be a scary thing to yeah. go dive it into the water head first wearing a big heavy suit like that. Well, and then for it to start taking water on, I yeah. I don't know how you wouldn't panic to to be underwater and then having this added weight. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. Do we have anything else we need to uh, discuss here? I'm sure there's Maybe. tons of things we didn't cover that we... What, yeah. Super fans would would know. <laughs> well, I was sad yeah. when the two Rodans died at the end. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you and were talking <laughs> you were talking about the military. And I did definitely notice at the end when the when the folks were watching this happen, you had like the the engineers and the paleontologists and the those that group were standing together, and then you had the military group standing together. And then once the two Rodons were down, the military group just kind of looked around and smiled and turned around and got in their their jeeps and headed back. And all the rest were just kind of looking like yes. bittersweet yeah. or something, you know. Yeah. <laughs> was there destruction there was successful? No right? <laughs> we're done here. There was. <laughs> In the uh, original Japanese version, w was there any narration or anything about their, the demise of the two Rodan creatures? Or they just showed it? I, it's been a while since I've seen it. I, I don't remember them okay, having yeah. any sort of narration. If they did, it was so um, well done that I didn't or really maybe even notice it. Commenting. Because what we, you know, we got uh, in the dub version, we got a wrap up. All mm -hmm. right, uh, of what happened to the two? Yeah, the and volcano. and uh, how the main character hoped that he could love as strongly as the Rodan who sacrificed itself for its mm -hmm. mate to die with mm -hmm. its mate. Mm -hmm. so. Oh yeah, they didn't. Uh... They didn't say that. I, do you remember that, Jeff? I don't remember anything no. like that. I just remember feeling like, oh, he's supplement. going down. Yeah. Yeah. There <laughs> might have been some comments from the spectators, you know, or, yeah. the, or the military and, guys watching it, but it wasn't uh -huh. like a narration or a long mm -hmm. deal. And I love narration. that scene, though. That's a, yeah. Mm -hmm. strangely effective, even though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The motions aren't really realistic, but it, but it was like, it felt like wounded and damaged and. Mm -hmm. And the other one oh, just yeah, went right to it. It just yeah, was like yeah. just 
flew right to it. And yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the narration fibbed a little bit because it said that those two were the last of its kind. But as we know, <laughs> Rodan showed up in Godzilla movies later, right? <laughs> when they started doing the monster bashes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, Godzilla died many a time uh, <laughs> itself. So, well, yeah. even to the well, point where point. later, That's a good point. <laughs> later they started to say that there were different Godzillas and everything too. So, but anyway, well, apparently they were planning a sequel, uh, but changed their minds after all of the U.S. insect, you know, giant insect movies. Black Scorpion, uh, I suppose, and them, and uh, the praying yeah. and the mantis, the giant mantis. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, them, the ants. Rodan is a great character. R Rodan, sorry, is a great character, and uh, I think this is a terrific origin story. So hopefully, most of the listeners have seen this film before, and we've. Uh, hopefully cause them to consider a revisit to either one or both of the versions. I'm going to watch the original Japanese again soon too. Uh, but if you're only familiar with Rodan from him being an, a foe or alternatively ally of Godzilla in later Godzilla films, uh, highly recommend checking out the origin story of this wonderful mm -hmm. monster. Okay. Well, that's it for this episode, but every two weeks we'll be focusing on a specific film released between 1920 and 1969. Next up is one chosen by Whitney. What are we watching next, Whitney? The Hitchhiker, directed by Ida Lupino. Yeah. Awesome. And I think that's it? awesome. I mean, it, technically that's classified as a film noir, but right. it's like a psychotic hitchhiker that kills people. It actually Perfect. starts off with a <laughs> lot of similarities to The Hitcher. Mm, yeah. uh, so um, so we're, we're going that way. And plus, you know, we got to get some women directors in here, too. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, great. Plenty of ways to stay in touch with us. Please send feedback to feedback at gruesomemagazine.com or leave comments on Gruesome Magazine's YouTube channel. Or at Gruesome Magazine's H and R D O H podcast Facebook group, or at the website gruesomemagazine.com. Catch us again here in two weeks for another great horror movie of the classic era, as only decades of horror can do it. <sighs> Say good night. Night. Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Some magazine.